Have you ever been scrolling through eBay and one of those listings for a CNC machine for like 200 bucks pops up? And of course you know a lot better than to actually buy one? Well this is one of them. Frankly I've wanted one for a long time, just really to see what 200 bucks can get you nowadays. Now I'm not expecting too much from this machine, but if I'm able to make parts with it, I'll be pretty happy with it. Anyway let's get this box opened and see what we have. Now there is going to be some assembly required. These small CNC machines are generally sold as a kit, but it shouldn't be too difficult to put this thing together. So according to the book, this machine is the 3018 Pro. There is a regular 3018 for a little bit less money, I think 20 bucks less, but the Pro looked to be a more substantial machine, at least online, and I really want to give this thing a fighting chance at actually working. And credit where credit is due, these manuals look a lot better than they used to. Going by the photos, what we have are two pieces of plastic that work like some sort of enclosure. For filming purposes, I'm probably not going to use these. Now it looks like the frame of this is going to be made from 20x40 V-slot aluminium extrusion. There's a bit of swarf left in the hole, so I might go in with the tap and clean it up before I assemble it. The table is also going to be another piece of V-slot extruded aluminium. It seems to be pretty sturdy though, which is a good sign. And we also have what looks to be our linear rods and our trapezoidal thread lead screws. I'm guessing there's going to be some sort of anti-backlash mechanism somewhere in the kit. If there isn't, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. It looks like they packed in a lot of screws, so hopefully we don't have any left over. We have a bunch of springs, and I guess this is going to be a part of that anti-backlash system. Now that's one thing I wasn't expecting, or at least I didn't get from the photos. The gantry columns are actually made from plastic, as are the front and back pieces of the frame. Now the plastic is pretty solid and it's also very thick, but at the end of the day, it is plastic, so this might cause us some problems down the line. Now what we have here are some really tiny stepper motors. Going by the dimensions, these are going to be NEMA 17. For small mills of this size, that's probably going to be big enough, but honestly, these things are tiny. They've included some spanners and hex keys, I'm guessing to help put it together, and to undo the collet on the spindle. Now it looks like what we have here is a very basic clampdown kit. It's just some hex bolts and some thin steel. I've used this type of clampdown system before, and they never work all that well. In time, I'll probably end up replacing this for something a little bit more substantial. Now it looks like the Z-axis and motor is pre-assembled for us. According to the spec sheets, it's a 150 watt 775 motor, which is pretty small, though it is a pretty small machine. 775 is a pretty common motor size, so we can always replace it for a much bigger motor in the future. Now it looks like the whole assembly is made from plastic, which is a big red flag. Plastic is probably going to cause a lot of issues down the line in terms of rigidity, so it's something to look out for, and I might need to replace it. I'm guessing this is the offline control board, so we can control the CNC machine without the need for a computer. And it looks like we have the main Gerbil CNC control board. As far as first impressions go, they've done a pretty good job. Everything's packed in really nicely, nothing's damaged, and it looks to be really well made. Now putting everything together is pretty straightforward, and it should only take about an hour or so. The instruction manual is pretty good, and it's pretty clear on where everything goes. I would recommend, if you can, just going through the tapped holes with a compressed air gun, or at least a tap, because there was a fair amount of swarf and junk and other grit that was still in there that needed to be cleared out. And for good measure, all the holes needed a bit of deburring afterwards. The rest of the build is pretty much just correctly bolting stuff in and getting everything properly aligned.
When you're assembling the gantry columns, there is a fair amount of alignment that you need to do with some of the V-nuts, and that is a bit time consuming, getting everything aligned up, but that really is the worst of it. If you can, I would recommend having a set of 1-2-3 blocks, or at least a tri-square on hand, that will help you align the table to help make it square. Having a set of calipers is also really handy when it comes to setting the position of the gantry supports so they're both the same distance from the back of the mill. Wiring the board up is also pretty straightforward. The board is nicely designed, everything is spaced out and properly labelled, which is really nice to see, at least compared to some of the other CNC boards that I've had to deal with over the years. Just make sure you don't confuse the X, Y and Z axis when you plug everything in. Finally, I'll plug in the offline controller and fingers crossed that when I flick the switch, it all turns on. And thankfully, it seems to be working. Everything seems to be moving quite well without any problems. Overall, the build quality is pretty good and the assembly process went without any issues. And I also like the offline controller. It's really simple and straightforward to use. So like I said at the beginning of the video, this is the CNC 3018 Pro. 3018 being the X and Y cutting area of 30 centimeters by 18 centimeters. Frankly, this is a pretty big cutting area considering the overall size of the machine. Measuring it, it comes out to being about 400 mils wide by 330 mils deep by 220 mils high. For what I paid, I'm pretty surprised with how big it actually is. Now, I also was surprised to see the Vevo logo on the machine. This is the same company that I bought the dividing head from. If I was going to make a guess, I would say that this is just a rebranded generic 3018 Pro. I don't think Vevor make them themselves. I have seen other generic ones that look almost identical to this one, so I'd suspect that there's one factory in China cranking all of these out, and other brands just slapping their logo on it. Now the spindle on this machine uses ER11 collets. This one came with a 1 8 inch collet and a bunch of 1 8 inch cutters. So it looks like they gave us 5 30 degree engraver bits. I'm not a huge fan of these V bit engravers and they also gave us some 4 flute end mills. For the sake of chip evacuation, I think 1 or 2 flute cutters might be better suited to the work here than 4 flutes. Now the size of the machine is probably going to limit us, but it's not a bad idea to get your hands on a quarter inch ER11 collet so you can use larger shank end mills or router bits. I'll definitely need this for when I make a waste board. Now one thing that I didn't notice initially when I unboxed it was that the spindle attaches to the motor using two grub screws. It's pretty similar to how the chuck attached to the motor on that $40 lathe that I picked up last year. In fact, I'm pretty sure they were both using the same 150 watt 775 motor. The problem with doing it this way are the issues that it can cause. One is that it's not hugely rigid. The shaft is only a few millimeters thick and it's probably going to bend under load. It was a big issue with the lathe, so I'm expecting to see it here. The second problem is it's not a hugely precise method of attaching a spindle. I'm expecting to see a lot of run out or wobble in the spindle. I'll attach a test indicator to the spindle to see the run out. And as you can see, just in the spindle alone, we're almost getting 0.1 of a mil of run out or wobble in the spindle. Just for reference, the big import mill that I have has less than 0.01 millimeters of run out. So this is almost 10 times that. Now I did try to reduce it by loosening one side and tightening the other grub screw just to try and push it into concentric alignment and it might have improved it a little bit by maybe 0.01 or 2 of a mil but it's still pretty far out of whack. Turning the motor on, you'll be pretty surprised that for such a small spindle it's really loud. 
I mean, it's almost as loud as my big milling machine. And there are a lot of vibrations coming from the spindle. No doubt that a lot of it is coming from that spindle run out, but I'm sure a lot of it is coming from that collet nut. Now depending where I go from here, I'll either make an enclosure for the mill, and I'll probably end up replacing the motor as well, because it's crazy how loud this thing is. The final thing I'll address is the rigidity of the machine, and as you'd expect, it's not that great. The frame itself is surprisingly sturdy, for being held together by only plastic and aluminium, it doesn't flex all that much. And neither does the gantrig. However, there is a fair amount of movement in the table. There's a fair amount of backwards movement in that anti-backlash spring. It probably has to do with the fact that the spring was not all that strong, so I think a lot of it could be fixed by using a stronger spring. However, there is a small amount of upwards and down movement in the table, which would be a little bit harder to get rid of. Unfortunately though, there is a lot of slop and movement in the Z-axis, and most of it is coming from that linear rail and its guide. And this is unfortunate, because we really need this part of the mill to be as rigid as possible. I can see this causing a lot of issues when it comes to machining, so if there's one area that I need to upgrade in the future, it's probably going to be this. With all of that out of the way, let's get into actually making something. My preference for doing this is always to use a computer, even though I can use the offline controller. I'll plug in the USB controller and I'll install the drivers and software that came with the included USB. The included Gerbil controller is a program called Candle. I haven't used it all that much, it's a little bit basic, but it works just fine. I know there are other ones out there, but this one is doing okay, so I'll stick with this one for the moment. Using Candle, you can look at your G-code and control the CNC machine. Overall, it's simple and straightforward, and it should only take you 5 minutes to get it working. To put all of this into context, I bought one of those CNC 3040 machines about 7 or 8 years ago, and setting that up was a complete nightmare. Just figuring out what pin was to do with what on the control board to actually wire it up in Mark III was a huge pain. Plus, I also needed a PC with a parallel port. This, compared to that, is just night and day. They've made it so much easier to do in the 7 or 8 years since I bought that machine, and I really appreciate it. I used to have a few videos of that on YouTube, but I can't find all of them at the moment. Now back to the 3018, I'll first do a test in some pine wood. The program came with a few test files, which will just be a few letters engraved onto the wood. To do the engraving, I'll be using this single flute engraver bit. I'll clamp the wood down using the stock clamp down kit that came with the router. To prevent the bolt from digging into the table, I'll be using the disc that I made for the Big Mills clamp down kit. And after using this once, I can tell you that the first thing I'll be replacing will be the clamp down kit. The bolt's just too small for the slot and it's not that nice to use. I'll move the bit over to where I want the work to start and I'll set the origin on the PC. And I'll also set the Z origin. Finally, I'll click go. And purely as a wood engraver, I think I can give this thing a pass. The resolution is pretty good, and the letters are coming out really nice and crisp. So far so good. The next thing I'll try will be the same G-code in aluminium. To give it a chance, I'll slow it right down, and I'll reduce the depth of cut. Now some cutting oil really helped it here, but it is struggling quite a bit. I'm sure you can hear it and see it in the footage, but there is some deflection with the cutter. I'm pretty sure all these issues are stemming from the spindle rigidity, as well as the lack of rigidity from that Z-axis frame. I'm almost certain that if I'd used one of those V-bit cutters, it would have probably broken. The cutter left a bit of a burr, which I'll sand down. 
To be fair to the mill, this grade of aluminium is not the nicest alloy to machine, so a burr is no surprise. With it cleaned up, it actually looks a lot better than I thought it would. There are some parts that turned out better than others, but I was expecting it to look a lot worse. I don't know, I'm kind of impressed. I switch over from an engraving bit to an end mill, so I can actually cut out a profile. I'll be using Fusion 360 to make the G-code. I don't normally use Fusion, but it has a pretty good cam software, and it has a post-processor for Gerbil code, which means it can make G-code for Gerbil machines, which the 3018 is. I'll have to do a long video on CAD and CAM, but all I'm doing is telling the software what I want cut, how I want it cut, and what cutter that I'm doing, and it's generating the toolpaths for me. And the model that I'm using is just a bottle opener that I found a few years ago. I'll do the first cut in the same pine that I used before. I'm doing a 1mm depth of cut at about 300mm a minute. I am having to vacuum it all up since the end mill's not evacuating chips that well, but so far it's cutting quite well. There are a few burrs on the wood, but so far I'm not getting any chatter and it's cutting quite well. After the cut, I could see that there was a fair amount of wood built up in the flutes. That pretty much confirms that a move to a one or two flute cutter would be the way to go. I also tried the same code with some hardwood. The one mil depth of cut was probably a little bit too much for this machine to handle, even with a reduced feed rate. In the future, when I'm doing hardwood, I'll probably reduce it to a 0.7 or 0.5mm depth of cut, that would probably suit it a lot better. So for wood, this mill can certainly get it done. The next thing that I want to see is how well it cuts plastic. I use some double side tape to tape down some 3mm acrylic. Now acrylic is pretty messy to machine, but it machines up quite nicely. I'm using the same G-code as before, doing a 1mm depth of cut, though I'm able to take it a little bit faster than I was in the hardwood. With the cut done, the edges are a little bit rough, but some needle files can easily fix it up. Well that looks to be done pretty nicely. Finally, I'll try machining some aluminium. I have seen people use these machines to machine aluminium, but typically they're upgraded in some way, usually a bigger spindle, and some method of making it more rigid. Here, I'm only doing a 0.1mm depth of cut, and it's still struggling. The biggest issue at the moment is just that lack of rigidity. I'm sure if I could improve it, I could machine aluminium without too many issues. Well for $200, I'm impressed. I know it has some problems, but I'm still impressed with the quality and what it can do. If you want to learn basic CNC and basic CAD and CAM, this might be worth considering. Just know that there will be limitations. And you know what? This can be a lot of fun to use. Even though it does struggle a bit, I've had a lot of fun using it over the past few weeks. With the standard machine, I would recommend sticking to only plastic and wood, but for me, that's not enough. Over the next few weeks, I'll try and pull it apart and see what I can do to upgrade it, and hopefully we can get around to machining aluminium in a few weeks' time. I'm really excited into seeing what I can get out of this machine, and hopefully turn it into something that's being capable of being called a mini mill. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that, thank you very much for watching, see you next time.